joining us today at the second annual event that is the only one of its kind in the world, a disability-themed Comic-Con to which we have been referring affectionately as our and your quick con. How many of you were here yesterday? You can stomp or snap. Was anyone not here yesterday? So if, if there were no there are no new folks, I won't repeat some of this information. I just want it to be as inclusive as possible. But in the spirit of uh, brevity, I can not repeat all of this. All right. So there was no one who was not here yesterday. That's probably a triple negative. All right. Then I'm not going to read all this again. Excellent. And we'll have more time for questions. So I just wanted to quickly make a couple of announcements, however. The name or title, Take Away the Suit and What Are You?, was coined by a team of students who work closely with Jill Hilo from the Division of Student Affairs Communications World. Jill is an amazing human being and a dear friend, and she is the Director of Communications for the Division of Student Affairs. So we were thinking when we decided, of course, that we were going to make this an annual um, event, that it would be very important to have a name change that's connected to themes every year. So the inaugural event was called Fantastic, Heroic, Disabled. So exclamation point, exclamation point, question mark. What does disability mean, et cetera? How is it defined and understood? Um, and this year we thought we want to stick with, of course, cripping the Comic-Con, but we needed a new kind of designation. So we asked Jill, and she worked with a team of undergraduates, and they coined several different, you know, phrases, and we chose take away the suit and go off. So I want to thank the students, because it was the students who named this event. So thank you for, for that. And again, want to acknowledge that um, we will have a number of different kinds of activities today. Thanks for your patience with tech negotiations. We have a desire to be as inclusive as possible of multiple audiences, and consequently, we have Skype options. But when you have Skype options, you have technological negotiations. So thanks for your patience um, with that, and we're doing our very best. We also have pre-recorded sessions. Um, and I, we will have more door prizes later um, after, after we wrap up, okay? So what I'd like to do now, one more thing. I just want to remind people that we have a quiet room, um, and I wanted to make a quick remark about that that I did make yesterday. Um, People with different kinds of identities might prefer, need, or even require a place to have low stimulation. But even those of us who don't have those kinds of identities might benefit from such a place. So we have um, a beanbag chair set up in that room, and we also have um, a little circus tent for kids to kind of curl up and chill out, um, and that's designed in an accessible way as well. So if you need a place to kind of take a moment because you're feeling like, oh boy, there's so much going on here, please uh, use the opportunity to use our chill out room. Okay. So I will now introduce with joy the grumpiest cat ever, Mr. Ethan Lewis. A round of applause for Mr. Lewis, who's on the planning committee. And Mr. Lewis will be introducing our keynote speaker, Ms. Becky Carr. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Give a round of applause for all of you guys who are awake this morning, my gosh. I feel a little CripCon hung over to be honest with you, so please, be patient. Um, so me and Becky have been emailing back and forth, um, my gosh, probably every week for months and months, and I feel like when we met, uh, like just yesterday, that we knew each other pretty well, so. Um, Becky, like many of us, really cares about representation in media. Um, I, I think that me and we, we both and many of us share the idea that without proper representation in media, how are people supposed to learn about us, right? Like, we're not, ever, we can't be everywhere at once. So a lot of times how people learn, unfortunately, is through television. And television and media and all the different media sources you're going to talk about really change people's ideas about the way the world works. I mean, even if we look at things like women's representation in media, and if you look at the 50s versus now, women actually have roles, jobs. In the 50s, they were kind of a very stereotype. Um, we can also look at things like, I know a lot of people love to talk about Star Trek and representation, because we can look at race and how the, uh, having an African 
American woman on the first Star Trek series being space inspired African American women to go into NASA. So I mean, these things really matter. Ooh, ooh, yes, yes. I didn't know this was a question and answer already. <laughs> the first interracial kiss on mainstream television was Star Trek. That's right, because who doesn't want to kiss Captain Kirk? Okay. <laughs> so Becky Curran was born a little person in Boston, Massachusetts. Most recently, she worked in television uh, casting at CBS Television Studios after spending five years working at Creative Artists Agency in Los Angeles, California. As a motivational speaker and blogger, she's on a mission to find a way to change the way little people and all people with disabilities are perceived in the media, which ultimately influences the opinions of society as a whole. You can check out her website at beckymotivates.com, her blog at beckymotivates.tumblr.com, and follow her at Twitter at beckymotivates. And I know you have your information on the table, so if you guys want some more, just go grab it. So, without further ado, we have Becky. That's it? Really? Come on, guys. Woo! in changing perceptions of people with disabilities in the media is because there are only 30,000 little people in the United States. So that means when I go in public, most times people have never seen a little person before seeing me. That means that I'm judged by what they see on TV. Fortunately now with shows like Little People Big World and Little Couple and other shows that include little people like Game of Thrones with Peter Dinklage, little people are becoming more recognizable in society. But I still go places in public and the first conversation they have with me is, are you on that show? Or do you know about that show? Luckily, it's a conversation starter, but we still just want to be treated as people and don't necessarily have to just talk about the show. Another story that I heard recently that's not related to being a little person, but something similar, is someone was asking a young boy who happens to be deaf what he wants to be when he grows up. And he responded by saying, I didn't know that deaf people became adults. And this hit me hard because a lot of people don't know what they're capable of because they want to see someone like them doing what they may, want, may or may not want to do in the future in order to know their possibilities. I do hope we get to the day where we can all imagine that anything we want to do is possible but until we get to that point, we all need to and want to have role models. Just gonna sh oh. Well, <laughs> there are 54 million US adults with disabilities. A lot of people forget that disability is the one category that you can fall into at any point in your life. It's, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll go to this. But that, that was mentioning pretty much disability insights. They do a lot of research about people with disabilities and they found out that there are 54 million people. It's the largest minority group that anyone can fit into. One conversation that I was having with someone who works at SAG AFTRA, where I will be working as of Monday, is their members are allowed to play the part of anything that allows them to act. A lot of people worry about the fact that there are people without disabilities playing roles of people with disabilities. Everyone wants to have a fair chance, but the argument is that there are just so few roles that come up for people with disabilities, and that's why we're concerned.
concerned about how people are represented. There was a story that I heard when one of my roommate, who's a little person, when I lived in California, I was there for six and a half years working in the entertainment industry, and he went on an audition. It wasn't a role for a little person, but he was there auditioning at the same time as his friend, who happened to be average height, able-bodied, able to audition for a role for someone in a wheelchair. This guy ended up getting the part, but he told the casting directors that he didn't want the part until they went and auditioned every person they could find in a wheelchair. And then he said, if I'm still the right person for the part, then that's okay, we can go forward. But he wanted to make sure that they did their research. And that's half the problem. As Naomi was <laughs> mentioning yesterday, you can't shoot the messenger because I learned by working in casting that they go by what the writers and directors and producers want to have with the description for each role. They're not willing to go out of their comfort zone and send someone to an audition that the producer or writer may be surprised by. They want a clear definition. Another thing I was talking to Ethan about is the people with disabilities who are now represented in the media, a lot of them end up being Caucasian. The interesting thing is with the description of someone who's a little person or someone who's in a wheelchair, when it's in a casting notice, it really just talks about the disability and doesn't necessarily separate it out by ethnicity. Maybe we can get to that point, but it would be nice if all of diversity could be combined together and we could all have an equal chance at everything. I was also talking to sag about how every part of diversity needs to be combined because we're all facing the same type of stigmas and obstacles that other people don't have to face. We're judged by the moment we walk in a room. For me, I can't hide my difference, and I'm okay about embracing it. And another part of what I love to do when I'm speaking is get people to open up about their internal differences. So many people have trouble going through life because they're hiding so much from the world, but they don't know how much they can connect with people if they just open up. But until people stop making fun of people who look different, those people are going to feel less comfortable about opening up. So a big problem with the mainstream media is just that they will take any image they can with little people especially. People will use average height people and they will have them shrink down with computer animation and they will still continue to call that a little person. I know there's just been so many incidences where there's someone playing the role of a little person who's never met a little person. So now they're basing the way they act on how they perceive little people. Peter Dinklage is a perfect example of how far we hopefully can continue to go. He is known as a talented actor who happens to be a little person. And that's really what we all want. We want an equal chance in society. We don't want people to feel bad for us because if they feel bad for us, that's just gonna start separating us a little bit more. And we don't want that. If you were to ask Peter Dinklage, he probably would say that he's not a little person. Peter Dinklage does not associate with the little people community. There's nothing wrong with that because he's been able to create his niche and create an example for the community without having to be a part of it. And we all would love to not even have groups separated by difference. It would be nice if we could just be part of society. But we still haven't gotten to that point. <laughs> These are some examples of some great projects that do include people with disabilities. When I worked out in the entertainment industry, I started to get to know a lot of people who happen to be in front of the camera or behind the scenes who have some relation to disability. A lot of these stories have a backstory and people who produce these shows have been affected by someone in their family or friends who happen to have a disability and that's why they feel comfortable writing about it. People who aren't connected to disability or don't think they're connected to disability or are hiding the disability they're connected to aren't as likely to share their stories. It really starts with the stories that the writers put together and then that becomes an example for the community and it allows people to see 
into our lives, especially with the sessions. Helen Hunt is a sex therapist, and she is pretty much teaching a paralyzed man how to have a sex life. People are confused about people with disabilities, especially people who happen to be paralyzed. They don't think that they can still have that type of life. And there are so many assumptions out there. I tell people, ask questions and don't make assumptions because you're gonna learn so much more about the community. Here are just some really talented actors and actresses who happen to have disabilities, who've been in the mainstream media, and they've done great jobs, but this list just needs to grow. I did a lot of research when I was out in California, and I tried to seek out all the actors and actresses who happen to have disabilities and put together a database, because all these people want to say, oh, there's no one out there, but I want to continue to prove to people that there is talent out there, and there are people out there, and they just need to give them a chance. Sometimes the argument is liability. We don't have enough insurance to have someone with a disability on set. Well, what about children and animals? That's gonna cost just as much. They're making these assumptions that are unrealistic. This is a huge example that I was affected by, the two Snow White movies that came out the same year. Mirror Mirror had little people, and Snow White and the Huntsman did not. There were little people who actually had to go to London and train the actors who were acting as little people in Snow White and the Huntsman. They had to continue to be behind the scenes and not show their talents, even though they're the ones teaching them how to play the role of a little person. Luckily, they thought to at least do that so they could get to know little people, but it still is not an accurate portrayal of little people. The Farley Brothers, perfect example of producers and writers who have been affected by disability directly, and they were told that they need to start including people with disabilities in their films by their friend, Danny Murphy, who was with them on a sailboat when he became paralyzed. He told them, when he went to one of their movie premieres, that he did not see anyone with a disability in their movies, and he wanted to know why. So from that point forward, they made sure they were aware of that. And they know now that it is a part of everyday life and it can happen to anyone. Their friend became paralyzed well lived he was with them. And it's sad that we have to wait till those moments, those moments of tragedy for people to think, let's include people with disabilities in our projects. We're part of everyday life. And it would be a more accurate portrayal if more people talked about it and opened up about it. Then Vince Gilligan is another great example from Breaking Bad. R.J. Mitty got to play the role that had cerebral palsy, and it became a big part of the story. It took Vince to open up about his story and how he was affected by someone with CP, and R.J. Mitty was then able to be the perfect person for the role. These are some great examples of celebrities who are very involved with giving back to the community and advocating for causes that are dir directly related to what they've been affected by in their lives. Greg Grover, he's been in Heroes. He's a very big activist in the Epilepsy Foundation because his son has it. One of the best conversations I had in Hollywood was with Colin Farrell. I first opened up to him because he was in In Bruges with another little person and that was my starting conversation, and then we had a deeper connection, and he was able to start sharing stories about his son with Angel Syndrome. It is a very rare, but he is a great father and really advocating for his son. A lot of people perceive him as Hollywood bad guy, but they don't know the underlying story with a lot of these people. And I always compare people with disabilities to celebrities because in reality, we all just want to be treated as people. I know everyone puts people on a pedestal. Even sometimes when I'm out speaking places, people will try to separate me from the crowd because they want to give me the special treatment, but I don't want that. I want to have the ability to connect with the audience and be a part of the event or whatever's going on. And I really enjoy just being able to connect with people and help them in any way I can. The Media Access Awards, they went away for a while, but now they're back. And there are awards that recognize people who properly include people with disabilities.
disabilities in their films, TV shows, or plays. It's very important for people to be recognized for the work that they do. I know a lot of times, even with the Oscars, people are recognized for going out of their comfort zone. You have an actor or actress who has a lot of makeup or has to wear a costume that's out of their element, and then they're awarded. But we're people who go through everyday life looking different, and we deserve to be rewarded as well if our work is great. I don't want people to just say, oh, you just deserve an award for being you. That would be the worst thing in the world. I was speaking in Kenya in November, and I told them, if I hear that any of you are telling someone to give you a break, I'll be really upset. We just want a chance, because if we're given a break, then that's gonna open a whole new can of worms. I have a lot of situations where I do open up about my story and everything I've gone through to get to where I am. When I went to California, I was supposed to work for a talent manager, and then I went there, and she, that fell through, and she happened to be a little person. So sometimes we can't even, I guess we can't even count on people in our own communities, but and that didn't stop me. I went on 100 interviews. There were so many times where I'd walk into a room and they would turn me down right the moment I walked in. But I still wasn't going to give up because I'm not going to let that get to me. I knew what my mission was and what I wanted to accomplish. And we all need to know what our mission is and think strategically about how we're going to approach an organization. The Little People Organization has had some situations where we're offended by The Apprentice. They had little people who were thrown washers because they were doing a project based on all mighty and small. There were, was another incident recently, Wolf of Wall Street, there was board flossing. There have been several different incidences that are inhumane and they've been portrayed in the media and then it affects how we're treated. But sometimes as an organization, a lot of nonprofits will not know the proper way to communicate with the entertainment industry. They won't have a strategic plan and they'll just have a reaction, and that does not get hurt. We need to learn how to strategically teach people how they're affecting us and why it needs to change. People don't want to hear it unless we have a reason that is well thought out. I listed all these organizations because if people around here are content creators, it's important for all of us to be our own content creators and put blogs and videos and everything else out there because we want our voice to be heard. As Naomi was mentioning the other day, you want to have Twitter posts and Facebook and everything. People will hear your message. If we have more people talking about how we want more inclusion, the more likely people are going to start seeing it and hearing about it. And these organizations are here as great resources if people who may not know as much about different types of disability, reach out to these organizations. They want to be properly represented, and they're the people who can give you the right facts. And as we always like to talk about, nothing about us without us. Include us in projects that have to do with disability, but also think about us even when disability may not be involved. We are still capable of participating in roles that don't have a description of disability. We're people just like everyone else. This is my info, but I'm going to open it up to questions and we can continue the conversation. Um, I was kind of like, I love the examples you gave of inclusion in um, TV. Um, but I was kind of surprised that you left out um, the TV show Switched at Birth, which features um, deaf characters and hard of hearing characters, and they only cast hard of hearing and deaf actors in those roles. And they even recently included a character with cerebral palsy, and they cast um, the young man that you had um, mentioned, RJ Mitty, or is that how you pronounce his name? Um, in that role. And um, I, I think they made history, was it last year or the year before? Um, they did the um, first ever completely, last year? Um, the first ever um, episode where the entire show was completely signed by all the actors, including the hearing actors. And I was just wondering, do you think it's progress or do you still find some things with the show that could be improved? That's a great question. One of the reasons, I guess, 
with my collages. Uh, I definitely am aware of that show, and I probably should have included it. But there's nothing I have against it at all. I think it's a great opportunity, and I had ABC Family actually reach out to me, and they want me to come by when I'm in LA next, just to give them more of a perspective on how they can include people with disabilities more in other shows. I think it's a great example for that community. And I think sometimes, because of all the different groups of different types of disabilities, sometimes people are so separated from the other groups, and even with a lot of people, their initiatives, no one really ends up talking about that. But it's such a great example of inclusion. It just hasn't been part of the main conversation because it's, that could be a bad thing because it's just kind of expected. Yeah. But it should continue to pass those people. And I've been working on a few projects with someone who's done a lot of documentaries. We did a Kickstarter campaign and we've done a few of them where she's always including deaf actors and actresses in the projects. And it's great too. Any group deserves to be included, and the fact that they're being included and treated as people. That's the thing. I just want there to be media out there where we're not doing anything that we would regret. There are still those projects, especially with little people, who were cast in roles that we then will regret later in life. And that will ultimately affect someone's career as an actor, whether they're taken seriously or not. And because they're taken seriously, I think it's a great thing. Pictures and he just 
courage to open up, people will be afraid. But with the sessions, I know they did audition a lot of people who have been paralyzed, but I guess they, it still doesn't make it right, but I guess they just didn't find a fit, and I don't know if they tried to say they don't know about how they could get around, even though it's supposed to be someone paralyzed. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I know they did audition people. The guy took the as far as he was in it as a friend, but he I think he originally auditioned for the main character. And then they kind of switched their mind. A lot of times it's the writers and producers switching their mind last minute. shows that, you know, inclusion and integration is, you know, progressing. So um, I just wanted to know your opinion on that issue. I think what I was talking about earlier about with the audition process, making sure you audition people who have that described disability. But if there's no one right for the role, just like anyone for a job, if there's no one right for the job that you auditioned and then you finally find the perfect fit, it really shouldn't matter what background they come from or if they have a disability or not, but it needs to be an accurate portrayal because it directly influences how we're treated in society. But I was, I was actually talking to Naomi about this yesterday where her life has probably opened up so much more by being able to play a character with a disability. So you end up having more people who don't have a disability become advocates and part of the community. And that can be just as powerful. People who may have turned their back on disability in the past now know to embrace it, and then they can share with their connections how much it affects them and how much they enjoy being part of the community. I just have a quick question about some of these shows that started this past year. Like the Making the Fox show, Ironside, Dean Fisher, I think it is. Yeah. Now, I find it interesting that um, Michael's show about a man with Parkinson's, portrayed by a man with Parkinson's, did not succeed. Uh, Ironside, of course, didn't succeed as well. And now this Dean Fisher has succeeded because he's actively working to hide his vision impairment. What are your thoughts on that? It's, it's tough, especially the fact that both of those shows didn't succeed. But even with Ironside, it didn't have the support of the disability community. People were horrified that, I don't, I think that may have even started with not even auditioning people in wheelchairs. And that's what got people frustrated. I think the community may have been happy for that to end just because of that mere factor. Michael J. Fox show, it's amazing that he was able to be himself. Maybe that just wasn't the right platform for him to do, or maybe he just wasn't ready, or maybe it need to, needed to have a different premise. I know there are a lot of shows, like pilots, that don't really get picked up, but they're still made, and I think it means that he just can't give up and he needs to try again, maybe try a different format. But if he were to get disappointed and discouraged and stop trying to think of his own projects, then that will make us more upset. 
and then hiding the disability. I don't like that. I don't like the idea of hiding the disability. I hope that maybe later in the plot it can open up more, and I think that'll help carry the story. But if they're saying they're including disability and then they're hiding it, same with musical chairs. It's a doc HBO documentary. They're saying that they include more people with disabilities than any other film. There's one person in a wheelchair in real life. You can't falsely advertise shows and say that they include disability when in reality they're recognizing the subject matter but not necessarily including it in the right way. I was wondering about your thoughts on the dancing, dancing with stars, with the stars. What the show is hiring? Yeah, I've heard both sides of this. I've heard um, the side that it's good to see her out there and really uh, exposing the community and, and showing what they can do. And at the same time, there's a lot of people that feel that show is exploitative, that they're exploiting her different things to kind of be more in the so-called group show for me, you know, where it's more of the that kind of violence rather than in that scenario, I feel it's a bit of her own personal choice in how she feels that she's being represented in it. Mm -hmm. I know, of course, the community wants to be a part of it, whether they like it or not. But I think one of the more frustrating things, Elsa was talking about this yesterday, when people automatically say, oh, it's so inspiring. Mm -hmm. And they throw that word around so much. And that's what's helping the show get more publicity, I'm sure. But it seems like she's treating it as any other actor or actress and just wants to, or any other dancer and wants to be a part of it and show her talents and abilities. I think it depends on how she feels about it. But definitely with the storylines, they're able to get that attention. Hi. I was wondering, in the population of people who um, don't identify as having a disability but are playing someone with a disability, are there any, in your opinion, that kind of hit close to the mark or just did better than most? I was, I was just wondering, in your opinion, and given your, your work background. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, <laughs> I know that you've been talking to Naomi about her role, and I think she did a great job. And I think it's just they really have to study the actor well. I have to say I haven't loved any of the people who try to be little people. <laughs> Maybe it's just personal preference. Uh, I just, I know they're out there. There were some really, like I did enjoy watching musical chairs, and there was talent there, but I just felt bad that no one was really in real life besides one person. So it's, it, it exists, but there's no one that like stands out amazing, and that's why it could just as equally be someone with a disability. And people get big awards for this, even if they're not amazing at it, because they're doing something different. So my question was just to set up the question, um, We've always talked about how it's like seeing somebody who's like you out there in the media is kind of like, kind of like your, your big motivator. But in my case, um, I have Asperger's, and growing up, I didn't see a lot of people in media who were who were like me. But I found, but I found <coughs> characters who were different from me, who I felt connected to because I felt like their struggles, in a, in a way, paralleled mine. And for some people, that might be problematic because it's like these people people are different from you. So in your opinion, do you view that as problem as problematic in a way? When you said different from you, do they also have some type of disability? I no, I would say more like able bodied both like especially like mentally. Okay. Uh, well because the little people community is so small, I've never been able to really find a little person to look up to. It just I haven't found it. And I I look up to people more based on the career path I'm interested in. When I wanted to do speaking a long, long time ago, I didn't think of, oh, I need to see another little person speaker. I just knew that was what I wanted to do. And that's what I want everyone to think about and want to do. And then it's easier to find mentors 
because you start attracting people in those fields. Sir Ken Robinson, who grew up with polio, he's from England. He's one of my greatest mentors. He's five steps ahead of me in his speaking career, but I can have someone who's done it and really took me on as someone who he believes in and knows my capabilities. I feel that I don't, I've seen other little people speakers, but nothing was, just like every community, like there's the, all these differences within each community. And it's really who you connect with and who you <coughs> admire, that you admire their work. But it becomes more applicable when it's related to areas you're interested in. And I think that's great to be able to see people outside of your disability. Yeah, I'm going to be selfish and give you a question. Um, so one of the questions I have is that it's, it's difficult enough to see people with physical disabilities and actors with physical disabilities. But we know there are actors out there who have mental illness who are very closeted about it. Um, I think one of the only people I can really think of um, who's very mainstream who's talked about it is Chris Evans, who has um, anxiety disorder, and he's been very open about that, but I think that probably took a lot of bravery in the fact that he's, you know, kind of Captain America, gives him a little leeway um, to discuss those things. So, how, what is the plan for also getting people with invisible disabilities out there? It really starts with the opening up. If there's a writer and producer who you feel comfortable opening up with, even if it's just at the casting session, then you become more, they become more aware of your story. And it's all about just finding one person or someone who's a content creator and they can put the story out there or they start thinking about it. I'm sure there are so many times where producers and writers, even if someone may not be right for the part, they go home and they're thinking about it. They're in bed at night just thinking, how can we? figure out how to properly integrate people. And invisible, I would say, is there are more invisible than visible. And we need more people to open up about it. And then a lot of those have to do, like anxiety and all of that, has to do with being afraid of talking to people and opening up your story. But if you do that, you might start feeling even a little better without needing medication. Uh, I see in your PowerPoint you had Dan Aykroyd, and he's just recently become public with his diagnosis. Yes, with Tourette's. Um, now, has he been known in the entertainment industry as having Asperger's, or is this something new? I think it's new. And related to that, I think people have speculated that if he didn't have this disability, and his obsession with ghosts, Ghostbusters, would have been made. Um, so what are your thoughts, I mean, what do you, what do you know about Dan Aykroyd? Yeah, no, I know that it never came up before. I think if, uh, when you're coming up with lists of people who would be good for the part, a lot of times in casting we get the description of a part and then we have to come up with names to put on that list. It never had to do with disability. It was just a male this age. And I hope it starts a trend of people opening up more. There are a lot of people with all types of disabilities in the industry. And I, I don't know if it's going to take another five years for the next person to open up. But if more people do, then they really, the more people open up, the more we can realize that we're all alike. And it's great that he's been able to open up. And we need more people who are high profile to open up. Because then people will feel OK about it. Oh, I can really relate. That story, how, if people, so many people, I would love seeing that story, just knowing they could relate to someone who's done a lot in the industry. Yeah, Thank you. yeah I was wondering if the industry is going to try to, to do more to support the invisible disability people coming out later. Because think of the young lady that just talked about mentors, and she said she had Asperger's. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if she knew Daryl Hannah just came out about it, I think three months ago? If she had known that this woman that did all this acting yeah. had Asperger's to the point of her parents were advised to institutionalize her, but she was able to act her way through it. I mean, I think invisible disabilities are very difficult because
because if you're going to be an actor, you're really not necessarily going to be somebody with the disability that you have. I mean, you're acting your way beyond your disability. But I think it's important, like Dan Ackroyd and Daryl Hannah have done, for them to come out. I wonder if the industry is going to start supporting more actors um, being open about their differences. I remember I was putting together a disability in media panel at the Writers Guild in LA. And at the end of the panel, someone asked me about, what about having an invisible disability? Like, is there anyone else in the room who has one? Or they asked kind of how to deal with the situation. Then someone else in the room came up to me and said, do you know where that person is who asked that question? Because this was after it had ended and everyone left. And I was so anxious to go try to find that person so they could have someone to connect with and talk with. I think it takes starting with one person to open up to who may be going through something similar. And then hopefully it can spread from there, from that person to that person. People don't want to talk about it right off the bat. They see people who look different and how they're treated in society. And they're going to hide it as long as they can. But it's more for their own sake. The fact that if people can open up more for their own sake, it'll just help them live a healthier and happier life. Wondering, um, and you may have mentioned this before, I don't know, I came in late. Um, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on like TLC shows like Little People Big World or Little Couple. Like, do you think they like promote the like freak show aspect? Or do you think they're really an honest portrayal? And what are your thoughts on this? Good question. Well, I have to constantly explain to people that I'm not the mom of Little People Big World. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say that. One thing about Little People Big World is it definitely opened up the world to little people, in, like in the title. One of the biggest problems with any of these shows when they talk about size, like Little People Big World, when I speak places, people always have the headline, the little person big message. <laughs> We're trying to get away from the size thing. But it describes the show, I guess. They're on a big farm. Middle of nowhere, Oregon. Most of what happens to us and how we're treated in society is in a big city. People will react. And it shows them leading their life just like anyone else, which is nice. But there are other factors. And then little couple, I enjoy that. I enjoy the story that they have. The fact that she's a doctor out in the world showing what she's capable of. When she was diagnosed with cancer, unfortunately the news was Cancer is rare among people with dwarfism. The problem is dwarfism is rare, and they just don't know how to treat people with dwarfism. It brings awareness to the subject matter, but reality is a really tricky area. I've been approached several times by production companies. They asked me if I wanted to be on a show for little people looking for love, if I wanted to be a matchmaker, like so many different random things. Oh, right now they're doing like a Sex in the City for Little People on Lifetime. I turned all of them down because that doesn't align with my messaging. And I feel that's going to exploit us even more. So as many that may be good, there are just as many that are continuing to harm us as a community. Um, could you just uh, talk a little bit about Miley Cyrus and her ah. <laughs> Yes. Just talk a little bit about Miley Cyrus and, and her um, recent sidekick. So it started with the VMAs. Miley Cyrus had a bunch of little people who were dressed up as teddy bears. Now she has a lot of little people who she brings on the road with her a lot. I have one friend who's a little person guy. He was asked to play the guitar with her on SNL. He did not have to dress any differently. And he thanked her. Thank you for not making me dress up. He, treated, he was treated like a person, and he enjoyed being on the road with her. But just the side of that, the next night after he left SNL, there were other little people who were coming and going to be her sidekicks as she goes on tour to other places. He was never <coughs> at a concert the same time as the other people, so it's like she goes back and forth. But the whole thing with the teddy bear situation 
especially as a little person, if you want to be treated as a talented actor, no one's going to know you behind the teddy bear costume. And that's a, like, if you just say, okay, I did that, but it's not really a part of my acting career, but no one knows it's you behind it. But if you start voicing your opinion, then people are going to start knowing. So you can't be taken seriously after that. How do you okay. think she benefits? My or? How do you think? How do you think she benefits from just the Kevin? fact that the amusement and being able to introduce her friends to her little people friends? I know Paris Hilton had a huge obsession as well. She would invite little people to her birthday parties, and it's just people like to have us there as props. There's a huge business of people who, in the show Pit Boss, which I don't think set a good example, they had on their spare time they would go and do gigs. So they're People, little people get paid all the time to go to parties. I got in an argument with some people in the industry who were saying they're advocating for people with disabilities, and they started posting post casting notices for a little person to be Superman at an agency party. First of all, a talent agency is where, little, where everyone wants to be represented, and now they're gonna say they want a little person just to come and be Superman? If a little person was Superman in the past, that would be a different story. And then they also had one posting where it said, we're looking for a midget who is gonna throw fairy dust in the scene in an independent movie. Like, why would you post that? I know people are gonna take those roles, unfortunately. And I think it really stems from how someone's raised and their values. And they don't realize how it will affect the entire community. But it's also harming them as being taken as a serious actor or person. So it's definitely a prop thing. <laughs> Speaking of props, I was wondering um, now that David Letterman has announced his uh, uh, retirement, you know, there's been lots of talk of Chelsea Handler taking over. Um, <laughs> you knew that question was coming, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, so what do you think of that situation? I, I, I don't remember her, her uh, partner there, but I know there's been a lot of questions of uh, exploitative. Uh, Chewy. Chewy, that's right. A little nugget. <laughs> Which, I mean, he has created his own persona. I mean, it is something he has invested himself in, but at the same time, I can imagine it. that message. So, <laughs> last year, I went to watch two little people run the marathon. And then I just took a picture where I was running in front of a bunch of runners. But I said I ran a few feet because I didn't want to claim that I ran the marathon. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a picture. Well, her company picked that picture up and put it on her Facebook page and her Instagram. Got thousands of likes and comments that were just absurd. So the following that they have, some crazy people. <laughs> and that's what made me realize that he's not taken seriously as a person and he's continuing to be a problem. And I know he's okay with it because of the fame factor. He's getting his name out there. But where do your values go from there. They love him. I know the whole team who works on that show because I used to work in comedy, but they love him. But do they love his image and where this will take him in the future? Because that's not going to be around forever and ever. Do you think he'll go with her, she thinks? Yes, probably. That would be interesting. I mean, there's, oh, sorry. Do you, do you think that uh, he'll go with her if she ends up going on front? You know, I think so. Yes, rather than has the Kardashians lead off on them. But, you know, no, they would be able to learn this. I would assume that he would, but I don't think it's going to change how it's treated. <laughs> I know they all love him. It's great, but do they know how his image affects how we're all treated? Like when she posted that picture, the comments that I got were based on the comments and the way they feel towards him. At the end of the day, it's about the audience and what they want to see. Does anyone else have any questions for Becky? And Becky, will you be around today in case yes. anyone wants and to take a card up question? there and let me know? I'm about to transition into a job at the Actors Union, so I will be working in diversity and making sure discrimination isn't happening in all aspects of diversity and trying to find more avenues for people of diverse backgrounds. I want to thank.
thank Becky not only for coming and speaking to us, but for the amazing work she does on behalf of everyone in this room advocating for better media. So if we can give her a round of applause.